Hello, and welcome to another session with the Grouchy Historian. We're going to continue our second video in the AP American History series, looking at conflict and American independence, the time from 1754 to 1800. All right, so let's begin. So we really begin this period, 1754, eh, I would actually be, say we begin this somewhere in around 1763 with the end of the French and Indian War. When the British captured Quebec and Montreal, the Treaty of Paris ceded Canada to the British, which ended the French dominion in Canada, basically the French presence in the Eastern colonial area and ended most importantly from the prospect perspective of the relationship between the British and their colonies, the major threat from the Indian tribes that had been allied with the French. After the war, the British began to reassert their authority over the colonies. This ended the area, as we talked about last week, of benign neglect, where the colonies didn't really assert strong political or taxation control over the colonies. This now ends because the British have a huge war debt to pay, and they figure that the colonies ought to pay their fair share, so they start imposing various forms of taxation on them, listed here. Hopefully you will study these all a little bit in your class. However, the colonies were used to ru ruling their own affairs, particularly when it came to taxation, and immediately pushed back and said if they were gonna be taxed by the British, they should have representation in Parliament. The British were not real keen on this. Just as important, the British passed the Proclamation of 1763, which in theory prevented the expansion of, of the colonists and colonial settlements into the territories between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi. That entire area now, of course, came under control of the British after the Treaty of Paris, and they were trying to keep down the potential for renewed conflicts with the remaining Indian tribes by trying to keep the colonists out. Didn't work real well. The colonies, in response to what they considered a usurpation of their rights as Englishmen, began to unify and resist parliamentary rule. Now, it's important to keep in mind at this point that the colonies, for the most part, still considered them loyal subjects of the crown, loyal subjects of the king. They just didn't think that parliament was treating them fairly. So they formed committees of correspondence, which were the beginnings, really, of a colonial form of government. They not only, of course, traded correspondence with each other, but as the colonies imposed various boycotts on British goods, the committees of correspondence helped to enforce those boycotts throughout the colonies to make sure that merchants and buyers did not cheat. In addition, in 1774, the colonists formed the First Continental Congress, which was their first attempt at some sort of, uh, of colonial government for all 13 colonies. And more importantly, they started to arm themselves or arm themselves more. The colonies had always had militias. This had been a standing requirement in almost all the colonies that able-bodied men have a musket and show up for drill every once in a while. But now they started to significantly drill to form organized units and more importantly, to acquire heavier weaponry, including cannon. And of course, there are the famous you know, Massachusetts Minutemen that formed to protect against any possible movement from the British in Boston out into the Massachusetts countryside. The British significantly underestimated the colony's willingness to rebel. As you'll see, by the, by the time the first shots were actually fired in 1775, the British had essentially lost control of the countryside of Massachusetts, the countryside of most of the colonies, and the only place the, the British truly ruled was Boston itself, where they had lots of troops. When the British sent troops out on April 19th to arrest Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and seize large quantities of colonial weaponry, they were met by militiamen in Lexington. Now, historically, nobody really knows who fired the first shot, but at the end of the day, it didn't really matter. Colonists were killed, fire was returned, and a running gun battle now ensued all the way back from Lexington and Concord back to Boston. The colony, colonial militia from all over the New England area quickly mobilized, bottled up the British in Boston, and now the Congress was, was stuck with, because by now the Second Continental Congress had, had convened, of what to do. Now there was still a significant body of the, of the colonies that did not want to break with England. In fact, they were not all that happy with everything that the Minutemen and those hotheads in Boston were doing. They still hoped 
to reconcile, not necessarily with Parliament, but they appealed directly to King George. That didn't go well. King George declared that they were in open rebellion. He sort of trash talked them in 18th century terms. And there was now really no choice of reconciling with England. So now you have the colonists who have to decide who are they going to, are, whose side are they going to be on? Are they going to be patriots, loyalists, or the inevitable undecided fence sitters? Now, when I first studied history way back in the day, when there was a lot less history, I was taught that it was basically a third, a third, a third. Best case, only about a third of the colonists actively supported the patriots and the revolution. About a third were loyalists. This is a pretty significant number. A lot of recent scholars have actually been looking at the American Revolution as the first American civil war, because there were a number of places where the patriots didn't fight the British, they fought other colonists. And they were be very uh, take no quarters type of battles. But for the most part, the patriots and loyalists were trying to get the attention hmm, and the loyalty of the fence sitters, and this would continue through most of the war. You would see a large body of true of American colonists, citizens, deciding who they were going to side with, depending on whose troops were in their neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Now, as the colonies formed this army and they decided they needed to get the British out of Boston, the inevitable question was who was going to command this army? Now, this is where our man George Washington shows up. Now, George is very subtle, very subtle. George never actively lobbied for the job of general in chief. He just showed up to the Second Continental Congress in his old colonial colonel's uniform. Subtle, that's my man George. However, as one of the colonists more, colonies' more famous soldiers, he was quickly given the job and began to try to form a bunch of ragtag militiamen into an army worthy of taking on the world's mightiest empire. Now, a little word about George, because everybody loves George. George as a general was not that great. Now, he was tactically beaten almost every time he was in battle. There's, my study has shown there's about three battles that you can actually say that George won outright hands down. The Battle of Trenton, the Battle of Princeton, and the Battle of Yorktown. Every other battle he fought, if he wasn't outright defeated, he might have achieved a, a draw in the terms of the day, meaning he basically did not let his army get destroyed. But George was, a very, was the critical strategic general because George knew two important things. One, as long as there was a continental army, there was a rebellion. So his number one job was never to get defeated. Number two, George knew that as long as he wasn't defeated, all he had to do was not lose and he was going to win. Now, he of course wanted to engage the British, he wanted to defeat them in open battle, but for the most part, he understood in the big picture that the colonies simply had to hold out until the British, A, recognized their rights, or after 1776 and the Declaration of Independence, that they allowed the colonies their independence. Now, little, little discussion of the Declaration of Independence, hopefully you will spend some time on this in class because of course it is one of the critical documents that formed our American democracy. But once you get past the, we'll just call it rather flowery language of the first part, which was important because it was important for the colonies to declare why they were in armed rebellion against the crown for independence. So if you actually read the entire Declaration of Independence, which I highly recommend, you will see that the colonies laid it out like a legal brief. They were in effect indicting King George and the parliament of all the offenses they had committed against the American colonies to justify armed rebellion. Now, sadly, like most large survey courses, and this seems to be a particular tactic of AP courses, they don't cover any military history, which I find extremely sad. But there are three battles that I think are worth a little more mention because they're important. The Battle of Trenton in December of 1776 was the critical battle that kept the Continental Army together when it was literally ready to disintegrate as most of the enlistments of the troops that had initially joined the army were up and they had basically known nothing but defeat since they had driven the British from Boston the spring before. Since then, they had been driven out of New York, they had been driven across New Jersey, and they were underpaid, underfed, and the British had them in their palm of their hand and let them go. And Washington made them pay. 
the Battle of Saratoga in the next year of 1777 served two purposes. One, it, it ended the British Army's last real chance of a battlefield victory by moving down the Hudson Valley and cutting off the New England colonies from the rest of the colonies. But more important, it showed the colonies were a viable force and brought the French into the war on their side. Oh, we do not want to forget about the French, eh? The Americans, of course, had opened up negotiations with the French almost as soon as the war had started. And of course, the French, eager to get back at the British, provided covert support for the Americans up until the Battle of Saratoga. Now the British were willing to openly provide arms, funding, soldiers, and most importantly, ships, which showed up at the Battle of Yorktown. From what I can tell, this is the only time the French defeated the British in a naval battle. There may have been a couple other ones, but this is probably the most important French naval victory in history because it allowed the colonies to secure the surrender of Cornwallis's army. Now, there's some really excellent books, of course, about the uh, uh, American Revolution. One of my favorite is by an author named John, a professor named John Furling, who wrote Almost a Miracle. And I think that's an excellent title. It was almost a miracle that the colonies had won the war. They had outplayed, outwitted, outlasted the mightiest empire in the world in 1781. And they had brought the British to the peace table. So the British decide for peace, the Treaty of Paris creates a new nation, and now the inevitable question is, now what? Now the colonies have to figure out how to rule themselves. And of course, these are a bunch of rambunctious, stubborn, stiff-necked colonists that jealously guard their freedoms at gunpoint. So now they had started in art, they, the, what they called the Articles of Confederation in 1776, they weren't fully in place until 1781, and they immediately had a huge number of shortcomings. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton decided that they needed to fix these shortcomings. So what they basically did was launch a coup on themselves. And in, in 1787, with our man George Washington back in command, they forged a new constitution. Now again, I hope you spend a significant amount of time on this in class because it is important. This, of course, is the Constitution that still governs our country today. And there was a tremendous amount of debate on every aspect of it. What is the proper role of government? Where should power lie? What's the proper balance of power between the states, between the federal government, between the executive branch, the legislative branch? Where does the judicial branch fit in? How does federal power versus uh, power meet up with state power? All of these things were fiercely debated because of course the colonists having just won their independence from England, many of them were very leery of a strong central federal government. And of course they were very concerned about their rights, which is why the first 10 amendments to the constitution passed almost immediately after its final ratification are the Bill of Rights. But of course now they have a framework for government, now they have to have a government. And guess what, George shows up again. Right, George Washington is pretty much the indispensable man. It is not too small to say that he is the father of our country because he becomes our first president almost by acclamation. Now, George is very keenly aware of a couple of things. First, all of the citizens are watching him. Again, they've just fought a war against the English monarchy. There were a lot of Americans that were afraid that we were gonna have our own monarchy with King George I, our own King George I, so Washington is very, very aware that he is being watched, weighed, and measured by his fellow citizens on how this new government is actually going to work. What does the president do? What does the Congress do? How, does it, how do they all work together? How does this government become functioning? And of course, like any government, they face a number of domestic and foreign challenges. During this time, you'll see the Whiskey Rebellion. That's right, our very first rebellion in the United States was about whiskey and the tax on it, right? It was, of course, about taxes. Again, not much changes. Americans generally are not all that fond of taxation, and Washington had to actually assert the power and authority of the federal government to collect taxes. Hmm. They also face a number of foreign challenges. The French Revolution, of course, enters a deep divide in the Washington administration between those who want to join the war on the side of France or stay neutral. Because almost immediately after the French Revolution begins, 
there's another European war when they chop off the head of the French king, the other powers in Europe go to war against France, including Britain. So now Washington has to decide what is America's foreign policy going to be? Are they going to get entangled in European politics? And George says, no. We also see, funny how history works. People are like, oh, politics are so partisan this, this year. All they do is backbite at each other. Nothing ever gets done. All they do is argue. Yes, and thus it has been so since 1792. The beginnings of party politics, driven by the, let's just say, conflicting personalities and viewpoints of Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, began to rear their ugly head. This is one of the things that Washington feared the most is the beginning of party politics and a split in the American, uh, we'll just call it ruling elite. But it happens. And we see that when Jefferson resigns from Washington's cabinet, that he's actually going to form America's first, we'll just call it opposition party, to the Federalists, who were the first, we'll just call them political party, and were the party of George Washington and his successor, John Adams, who not the most dynamic of guys, is sort of the placeholder, I call it George Washington's third term, between George Washington, who was a Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson, who was the first Democratic Republican president in 1800. Hmm. More on that in a minute. By the way, if you think we have messy elections these days, mm -mm, stay tuned. Okay, here's some terms and conditions. And again, as always, this is not meant to be all encompassing. There's still a lot of dates, still a lot of people. Uh, I would draw your attention to a couple of things that I put in here because I thought they were kind of interesting. <laughs> Number one is the Alien and Seditions Act. A, a lot of people are like, oh, we're just have our, our press under attack these days. No, actually there was a law passed in the 1790s that made it illegal to criticize the government in a newspaper. Remember back then, we didn't have MSNBC, we didn't have Fox News, they had newspapers. And boy howdy, they made no pretense about being partisan newspapers, uh-uh, new, new, new. You were either for the government or you were against the government. And they had a flowery way with the English language that would put to shame any modern American politician. I also put in here George Washington's farewell address. This is one of the great political speeches in American history. Washington was a prophet in a lot of ways, and he warned against two things. He warned against potters and politics, and he warned against getting entangled in Europe's affairs, which was pretty much America's foreign policy up until the First World War. Also some other things I think you need to uh, pay attention to, because again, they come out of the constitutional debate, but they're still relevant these days, are the great compromise that set the balance of power between the House and the Senate and the executive branch. The Federalist Papers, there are a number mentioned, um, I'm sure in your text, uh, there were over 50 Federalist Papers written, a corresponding number of anti-Federalist Papers written to support or defend the new constitution, and they are the sort of political backbone of how our government came about. They show you the thought process of the writers of the Constitution, of the first members of the American government. So they're still very important. And of course, there's the old electoral, electoral college, the misunderstood, controversial part of the Constitution that is still under attack 200 years later. So I hope you found this video illuminating, helpful and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks very much.